And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I've based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that with all my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map. And that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find some way to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church. And when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. If we could see the result of all that God does in every service for the Word of God is lifted and preached, we'd be dumbfounded and amazed at what God does. It's just not about uh, an attendance number on a board. How many people can you get coming faithfully to your church? The purpose of church is not for attendance. The purpose of church is for growth. But if we look in the mirror, we're not perfect either. And the truth is, again, you can't change the other person. You can't get them saved. You can't change their faults. But God can. But you can change your own faults through God's help. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, come to the end of what's best for you, Start doing what's best for the sake of the Savior. Welcome back to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez, here for the second part of our Church 101 series. Now, these episodes will not be titled as Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, or anything of that sort. What we'll actually be doing is we'll be listing off different episode topics that fit within this theme. Now, we've done a few series like this before, such as our Pastor 101 series, where we deep-dived into the subject of pastor, talked about some pertinent issues, some questions that people are asking commonly in today's world. Well, here we are with now Church 101, and this is going to be a series discussing all things about the church. We're going to be asking a a lot of questions in regards to church matters and some things that we discussed in last week's episode, episode number 296, Church 101, Common Church Misconceptions. I would encourage you to go back. That was the introductory episode, really introduced the topic, talked about what we're going to talk about in the future in this series. So if you missed that, that was episode number 296, Church 101, Common Church Misconceptions, things that some people think about their church that are actually wrong, and you need that foundation as we move forward in the Church 101 series. Now we're going to dive right into today's episode, but before we do, I need your help. That's right, you the listener, man, woman, teen, adult, whatever it may be, I need your help. I need you to get onto your email, and I need you to email me. My email is joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, my email is joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. I want you to tell me. I want to hear from the listeners. I'm working on something, and so I need to hear from you, all of you. I want to hear from every single one. So yes, I'm pointing my finger. You, right now, you listening, I want to hear from you, and I want to know what episode of Sandy Creek Stirrings or what thought or what series has been the most helpful to you, the one you've found the most, that you've shared the most maybe, that you've found the most, um, just the one that you've enjoyed the most, the one you found the most helpful, whether it be a series, whether it be a thought, 
whether it be a podcast episode, you don't have to remember the exact episode, but maybe you say it was this thought and you presented it in this, and uh, I want to hear from you, the listener. So I want you to email me. My email is joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, that's joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Email me, or you can send a message through Facebook. Just look up the Sandy Creek Stirrings podcast, and you will find us there on Facebook. You can send us a message through there as well. But I want to hear from you, so do it right now. For today's episode, we're going to be talking about church membership. Does it happen at baptism or later on? When does someone become a church member? When does it happen? At baptism? Is it after discipleship? Is it at a a later time just determined by the pastor down the road? Biblically, when does someone become a pastor? Now, for some, you're listening to the intro right now, And you're saying, well, this sounds like a dumb topic. This sounds like something that I have really no interest in listening to. So I'm probably just going to turn off the episode. But I encourage you just to hang on. Hang on just a second. This is a topic that is discussed more than you might think. There are conversations about this topic more than you might think. I've had some conversations with church staff pastors around the nation. I've had some discussions with friends, ministry friends, about this particular topic. And can I just tell you this? There is more to this conversation than what you might think at the first. And I think as you're listening today, whether it be you're on church staff, you're in full-time ministry, you're in part-time ministry, or you're just a church member, which there is no just a church member, without you, there would be no church. But no matter what type of person you are today and you're listening, I think you'll find this discussion to be a little bit more interesting than you might assume just listening to those opening questions. So I'd encourage you, hang on, give me another few minutes and see if I can catch your interest before you leave the episode. Now, I'm going to give just a couple basics real quick before we really get into the meat of today's subject. The first thing we have to talk about, obviously, if we're going to discuss this, then we have to talk about what qualifies someone for church membership in the first place. Now, we've already covered this in depth back in um, episode number six. It was Baptist History Lesson number two. So go back and listen. We discussed this part, what qualifies someone for church membership. Here's the short version. I'm going to give it quickly because I want to hold your attention. Those of you who are still determined, if you want to listen, I want to hold your attention. Give me just a minute. Let me explain this. Let me see if I can pull you in when we get into the meat of this subject. But the short version is this. Salvation and baptism are the two qualifications for church membership. If you want to be a church member, you need salvation and baptism. Those are the two things you need. Now, this was a view that was held by the early New Testament church in the Bible. This was a view that has been held by the Baptist church for thousands of years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So to to pull just one verse out of many that we could use, which is not what we do when we build a a build a doctrine, but uh, as I said, we've already discussed this in depth going back in episode number six, so I'm not going to do it in depth. So I'm just going to give you one verse today. If you want more, go back and listen to episode number six. But here we are. Acts chapter two, verse number 41 says this, then they that gladly received his word, what is that? They were saved. They made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. They accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. They received his word. They were saved. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, so there's salvation and baptism, and the same day there were added unto them. Now, what's that talking about? Well, specifically in context, it's talking about added unto the church. So there were added to them, that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's a lot of people. It's tremendous. That's great. It's a great story in the Bible. If you haven't read the book of Acts, you need to go read it. Tremendous passage there in Acts chapter number 2. But I want you to notice again the steps outlined in this one out of many passages. Salvation, then baptism, then church membership. 
That's all that was needed. Salvation, church membership, and baptism. Those are the two scriptural qualifications. Those are the mandates that you must have those to become a church member. Now, here's the real meat of today's question. Here's the real topic, the real question on the table. When does someone, though, become a church member? Because, you see, there are some people and there are some pastors who believe that there must be, or maybe there can be, a period of time between baptism and membership. They believe that a person becomes a a member of a church at a later time down the road, that you can get saved and then you can get baptized, but church membership comes later on down the road. And they'll often say that, well, a person needs to be discipled before they join the, join the church. Or they'll say that that person needs to show fruit of their salvation before they join the church. Or, and, and here's the one that I hear the most, is that that person needs to repent of their sin or leave behind their sin before becoming a church member. This is in contrast to a school of thought that is, Baptism is the door to church membership, that baptism makes someone a church member. So there's the two contrasting sides. There are some who believe that you can get saved and baptized, but you're not automatically a church member. Church membership happens at a much later time. And then there are some people who believe when you get saved and then you get baptized in a local church, it makes you a member. It adds you. That is the addition. That is the open door to church membership. Here's the question. What is biblical? What does the Bible have to say about this? Well, I'll be frank, because I'm going to try and make today's episode as quick as possible while still making it effective and doing justice to the Sandy Creek Strings brand, which is one where we are willing to deep dive and look at every single corner, every single aspect of the topic at hand. So I'll just be frank real quick. I think that the philosophy that church membership happens at a later time, whether it be that person needs to be discipled or they need to show fruit of their salvation or they need to leave behind sin before they can become a church member, I think that that is an earthly reaction to an earthly problem. See, we live in a sin-sick world. We constantly and we consistently have to deal with sin and church problems. And many times, we want to head off those issues before someone becomes a member. We would rather not have someone who joins a church, and now we have to deal with those issues, maybe affecting the church, maybe affecting the pastor. We would rather just head those off. And so I think this philosophy, this position of church membership happens at a much later time after some other occurrence I think that's just an earthly reaction to an earthly issue. Because here's the reality. I'll go ahead and spill the beans today. I personally, after examining this topic, after having talked with people about this topic, many people, after having discussed this and looked at this from a whole bunch of different angles, I'll spill the beans. Here's what I personally believe. I personally don't believe that the thought process that someone needs to be discipled or they need to show fruit of their salvation or they need to repent or leave behind sin, I don't think that is a biblical outlook. You say, why? And I say, notice the phrase in Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. I'll read it to you again. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So we have salvation, baptism. And notice this, this little phrase is what I want you to catch. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Notice that little phrase, and the same day. Acts chapter 2 verse 41 shows that these people were saved, they were baptized, and added to the church. They were made church members on the same day day. It does not list a different day down the road. It doesn't list a a couple months had gone by. It lists the same day. It does not list that they went through some sort of discipleship program. It doesn't say that they showed fruit of their salvation. It doesn't say that they gave up all of their sin. But it does make it clear that they were added to the church the same day. There's just really no gap there. Kind of like early on in 
Genesis chapter 1, there's just no gap there in the same way. There is no gap here. There's no gap of time given in this verse between salvation and baptism and church membership. It's the same day. It's almost listing it basically step by step. Now, for some, that may be the end of the conversation. That may be all that you needed to hear. But that's not enough for me. You know me. I like to deep dive into topics. I like to look at things from every single angle. And I don't personally derive my principle, my belief, from just one verse or one principle. But I want to see a little bit more, and I want to look at it from every angle. And what leads me to my belief that I believe that baptism is the open door to church membership, I believe baptism makes someone a member of the church, I believe it happens at the same time, I do believe that, and I think there are some more pieces of evidence that deserve some time and discussion, and we're going to do that right here. I do think if we determine that baptism is, or that church membership rather, is something that happens at a much later time, I think we have a a few problems we run into biblically and logically if we believe that some other thing, maybe it's just time, but some other thing is the door to church membership. I think we have some issues. I want to talk about this from all angles. And so the things that I have discussed with other men, other pastors, other church staff, other ministry friends that I've discussed this topic with have really boiled it down to three different things that they think, for those that hold the philosophy, the three different views that they often have that this is something that somebody needs to do or go through before they can become a church member. So I'm going to take a look at all three today and show you why I personally believe from the Bible, and just logically as well, just thinking through this, why I personally believe that these three major things just don't work from a biblical perspective to withhold church membership from someone. All right, so number one is there are some that I have met who believe that discipleship or some sort of foundation or some sort of basic discipleship needs to happen with somebody before they can become a church member. Now, this is one that's um, common, but I, I wouldn't say overly common, but this is one that I've heard from a few people. They want some sort of discipleship. So they'll see someone saved in their church, they'll baptize them, And then they'll have them in a foundational discipleship program. Maybe they go through step one of the discipleship program. Maybe they have three tiers of discipleship, and they go through tier one. And then that person will become a church membership after they've had time to look at the basic church doctrines and things of that sort. I think there are some issues, though, with holding that view from Scripture. Number one, I don't see that in Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. Now, I'm not trying to hinge everything off of that verse, but I think that verse is important in this conversation. And when I look at Acts chapter number 2, verse number 41, I don't see anywhere where these 3,000 souls went through some sort of discipleship program. It doesn't say they were saved, they gladly received his word, they were baptized, discipled, and added to the church. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say they, they gladly received his word, they were baptized, went through some a teaching seminar, and then were made the members of the church. It doesn't say that. Now, I also jump over to Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, a verse passage that you know very well. Matthew 28, verses 19, 19 through 20 say this, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. So what is that teaching all nations? That is giving them the gospel, going and giving the gospel. That's the salvation part of this. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So we have this this thing here where the gospel is presented, people are getting saved, and then we baptize them. Then follows verse number 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Teaching them to observe all things, what is that? That is discipleship. That's teaching them to look at what Christ has given us in his word and now observe, now do, now follow, now do those things that you see within Scripture. What is that? That is discipleship. And here's what we have, though. 
This passage identifies that discipleship is something that happens after salvation and after baptism. Well, we know from Acts 2.41, on that same day of salvation and baptism is church membership. It's a step-by-step thing that we see there in that passage. Well, if, if discipleship comes after salvation and after baptism, which we see here in this passage, then what happens first, church membership or discipleship? Well, if we use the example found in Acts chapter 2, verse number 41, unless the apostles had some sort of discipleship program that could happen in an hour or two, then discipleship on that day did not happen before church membership. You say, why? Y'all, they, they were preaching. 3,000 souls got saved, and they had to baptize 3,000 people. How long do you think it would take them to baptize 3,000 people? I would say most of the day. Several hours at least to baptize 3,000 people, and they were added to the church that same day? So what? They had 30 minutes, an hour, maybe two hours max to be able to see these people discipled? I just don't think that fits within the timeline of Scripture. When you put these passages together, it just doesn't seem to fit. Now, if you at your church have some sort of amazing discipleship program that can disciple somebody foundationally in an hour, I would love to get your information because I want to start using that in my church. And I'm not saying that mockingly, though it almost sounds like I am. I'm not. But if there is a discipleship program out there, I want to hear it. I want to see it because it will be tremendous. But for the reality of For most people, the reality is that discipleship can't happen in 30 minutes or an hour or two hours. Not for people to be truly discipled. Are you just trying to rush them through? Is this a new, you know, they they have this thing called easy believism. Is this easy disciplism? I I don't know. I I don't think you can rush people through like that and then say, well, you've been discipled. Here's the other question. Okay, if they do need some sort of foundational discipleship, then what doctrines do they have to know? How much of that doctrine do they have to know? Do they have to know the Bible verses? Do they have to memorize the Bible verses that prove those Bible doctrines? How much discipleship needs to be the case? Because if you're going to say discipleship is the door to salvation, or not salvation, but discipleship, excuse me, is the door to church membership, then you have to be able to answer those questions as well. Now, continuing to build really on this principle of discipleship happening after salvation and after baptism, which we clearly see in Scripture. And what I see in this passage, after after church membership, we do have that within Acts 2. Let me show you. Acts chapter 2, verse number 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So we have salvation, baptism, and church membership in that verse. Here's what came afterwards. Verse number 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had needed, they continually, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved." Now again, verse 47, we continue to have people being saved, baptized, added to the church. Same day. Same day. Same thing in verse number 47. But what we have in verse number 42 is this interesting little note. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. What is that? That's learning from the Word of God and then following that. What is that? That's discipleship. Which is happening again after salvation, after baptism, after church membership. So I don't think discipleship fits a biblical model for withholding church membership from someone. The second thing that I see that I've talked with some people about is some people want to see fruit of salvation. So we're putting discipleship up on the shelf. Now we're going to talk about fruit of salvation. Some people want to see fruit of salvation from someone before they allow them to be a church member. That person needs to show fruit. They need to see an evidence of a, of a change or some fruit of the Spirit or faithfulness, or they need to start coming to all the services, etc., 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 before they'll let them join. Now, what a lot of guys that I've talked to in this particular camp, 
the way they'll do this is, is they'll actually withhold baptism from a newly saved person and will not baptize that person until they, sh- they see fruit of their salvation. That's actually the most common thing I've seen with people who believe that fruit of salvation is necessary before church membership. They will withhold baptism until they see fruit of salvation. I specifically had a pastor that told me that directly, and he said, I want to see fruit first then I'll baptize them, then I'll add them to the church. I think there's an issue with that, and here's the issue. It's just not in the Bible. For example, to use to use the opening thought we gave for discipleship, for example, and I don't want to hinge everything off of this verse, but I think it's important to the conversation, Acts 2.41 doesn't show the apostles looking for fruit among the 3,000 people that were saved before they baptized them. I don't see that. I don't know that they even had time for that. Why? Because according to the Bible, there's there's really only one thing that keeps someone from being baptized. And do you know what it is? Salvation. Not fruit of salvation, just salvation. They say, what do you mean? We'll go to Acts chapter 8. You know the story. Philip is taken, and there's an Ethiopian eunuch riding in a chariot. He's got the, the scriptures there open. He's reading in Isaiah 53. And Philip catches up to the chariot says, Understand us what thou readest. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, How can I unless some man show me, unless some man guide me? I forget the exact word used there in Acts 8. So Philip gets up in the chariot, and then verse 35 says this, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, Hey, what is stopping me from being baptized? I would like to be baptized. What is stopping me? What will, why can't I get baptized right now? Here's some water. And here's what Philip says Philip gives the biblical qualification for baptism. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, hey, if you believe in Jesus Christ, the Jesus I've just preached to you, this gospel that I've just presented, if you believe that, then you can get baptized. It wasn't if you believe that, and now let me watch you for 15 minutes and see if you have fruit of that salvation. That was not it. It was as long as you believe you can get baptized. And here's how the Ethiopian eunuch responded. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What is that? That is salvation. That is profession of faith. Have you ever heard in a baptism, I baptize based on the profession of faith? That's what we have here in this principle, in this passage. What stops me from being baptized? Do you believe? He says, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot, verse 38, to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. I will say it again. Philip identifies the only need for baptism was salvation. It was not fruit. It was not salvation and fruit. It was just salvation. So I just don't see in Scripture where it's a biblical thing to withhold baptism from someone who desires to be baptized, and they have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. It's just not in there. I do have one more overall thought on that point, though. If you believe that fruit of salvation is the door to, for some, to baptism, and for others, to church membership in general, then here's my question to you. Who judges the fruit? Do I judge the fruit? Do you judge the fruit? What fruit do they have to show? There's lots of different fruits of salvation we can talk about. What what particular fruit do they have to show? All of them? Some of them? Which ones? How much fruit do they have to show? Can they show one fruit? Do they have to show two fruits? What, What do they have to show as far as how much? How long do they have to show the fruit for? How do I know they're not just faking it for 15 minutes? How long do they have to show the fruit for? You see, there is absolutely nowhere in Scripture that gives a basis for answering these questions in regards to baptism and church membership and showing fruit. There's just no, nothing there in Scripture about going through this process. But these are questions that if you hold to this, you do have to answer. Whether you've answered them in your head and haven't really thought about it, 
or whether you are prepared with an answer. You have to be able to answer those questions. Who judges the fruit? What fruit do they have to show? How much fruit do they have to show? How long do they have to show the fruit? You have to answer those questions if this is the view that you hold. And just frankly, I don't think you'll be able to because I just don't believe it's a biblical opinion. It may be an opinion, I just don't know that it's biblical. Number three, and here's the one that I probably see the most out of these three particular things. This is the one that I've heard the most. Putting discipleship up on the shelf, putting fruit of salvation up on the shelf. Some people believe that repentance of sin, leaving behind sin, casting off sin, repentance of sin, that's the word I've heard used most commonly, repentance of sin, withhold someone until they repent of sin, until they leave sin, that withhold someone from being a member of the church before or or after baptism. Here's the problem. Problem is, I just don't believe it to be a biblical outlook again. For starters, that's not a proper interpretation of true biblical repentance. Now, we are going to do on the podcast episode eventually a whole episode on what is biblical repentance. We'll use that title, What is Biblical Repentance? And we'll do a whole deep dive subject, maybe try and look at every single passage on repentance in Scripture. Let me give you a real quick, brief, short version of what is biblical repentance. Not going to go very deep. This is not the subject at hand, but it does tie into what we're talking about in this particular point. Repentance. Biblical repentance is not a forgiveness of, or asking a forgiveness of or quitting sin. That's not what biblical repentance is. I'll say it again so you can get real good understanding of it. Biblical repentance is not an asking forgiveness of or quitting sin. Now, you might be listening right now, and you're inflamed, you're infuriated, you're dumbfounded. Of course it is. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, repent of your sins. Really? Show me somewhere in the New Testament that has the phrase, repent of your sins. Show me one time where the New Testament commands you to repent of your sins. It's just not there. Look it up. The Bible shows that repentance is something different, and people often confuse repentance with a different word that starts with the letter R. Remission. Those two terms, I think, are so often misused because so many people believe that repentance is remission of sins. That's a completely different thing. Repentance, according to its definition, look it up in the dictionary, simply means a change of mind. It means a turning. Now, in certain contexts, yes, repentance can be used to mean to be sorry for a certain for a certain thing. It can mean to change your mind. It can mean a turning. But again, nowhere in the New Testament is repentance of sin specifically called for. Repentance is simply a turning from our current place, whether it be my my place I'm currently sitting is myself. It's faith in a false god. It's false salvation, religion, works, atheism. It's a turning from my current place and turning to God in his plan of salvation. That's what repentance is. It's a turning to God. That's all it is. That's why the Bible shows the distinction between repentance and remission. By the way, this is the only passage in the New Testament, that even comes close to saying, repent of your sins, and it doesn't. Luke 24, verse number 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, some people might shallowly look and say, well, it's saying repentance and remission of sins, so basically remove the conjunction, which means you can remove remission, means repentance of sins. No, 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 no. Repentance is something separate. He's talking about preaching two different things in Jerusalem. Repentance and also preaching remission of sins. Two different things. Because repentance is not remission. Here's what's being said. Starting in Jerusalem, the early church was to preach repentance or a turning to God 
and a and then to also preach a remission of sins to get away from sin to leave behind sin to don't do that anymore those are two different things you say absolutely not repentance means to ask forgiveness of sins it means to be sorry for your sin it means to leave behind your sin really then what was God repent? What sin was God repenting repenting of multiple times in the Old Testament, including Genesis six, where it says, "And God repented." And you'll say, "Oh no, 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 no! That's not God didn't commit any sin. That just means God had a had a turning. God had a change of mind." That's exactly what I said. Here's the deal: you want to go and you want to change the definition in the New Testament to try and fit a particular belief that you have believed mistakenly. Because if I hold the view that repentance has to be of sin, that's what repentance means, then I have to keep my standard all the way through. But everyone will admit, you listening today, even if you hold the view that repentance is repentance of sin, even if you hold that view, you will admit that it's not always repentance is not always referring to leaving behind sin. It is often referring to a change or a turning. And I think we can carry that out across Scripture. But we will eventually do, again, an entire episode on biblical repentance. But suffice it to say, why would I even bring it up? Suffice it to say for now that most guys who believe that a person must repent of their sins before church membership, they start off with a wrong view of what biblical repentance is to begin with. But I'll add to that. Number one, Acts 2.41. I'll use it again. It does not say anywhere in this passage that all 3,000 people gave up all their sin before they were baptized or became members of the church. doesn't say that anywhere. Number two, I have a couple questions for you. What sins do they have to give up? How much of those sins do they have to give up? How long do they have to be free from those sins? What sins are permissible? Because I don't think there's any realistic biblical person in the world who would say they have to be perfect and sinless before joining your church. So you are saying that some sins are permissible. Which ones? Show me in the Bible a list of permissible sins in the church. Here's one. What detective agency should I begin using in my church to investigate the sin and personal life of all prospective members? You see, if this is the view you hold to, these are all questions you have to ask yourself. Now, again, I'll back off a little bit and ease up a little bit. Don't get too intense. But most men or most pastors, most church staff that I've talked to who hold this philosophy, here's what they believe. They believe that this repentance of sin is referring specifically to sexual sins, sexual sins in the Bible that would remove someone from church membership. Those are the sins that we're talking about. Those are the sins we're we're referring to in this discussion, in this topic. And they're right. The Bible does list some sexual sins that would take a church member who is currently a church member and remove them from church membership. You're right. There are some passages like that. But there are a lot of things in Scripture listed that if someone has this in their life, They should be removed from church membership. They're already a church member. They, because of this sin, should be removed from church membership, like a brother who walks disorderly. Go back and look at that. What's the context? What does disorderly mean? Take a look at that passage. How about this one? Matthew 18. A trespass against a brother or sister in Christ that has not been dealt with. That removes someone from church membership. Heresy. Rebellion against the pastor. And there's many other things. There are a lot of things in the New Testament, especially in Paul's letters, that are identified as if someone has this in their life, this would remove them. A church member who's already a church member, this would remove them from church membership. And I think, here's what I think I think it's intellectually dishonest to say, well, I believe sexual sins are the sins that should be referred to in this conversation. That is intellectually dishonest. Here's the reason why. There are lots of sins that would disqualify someone from church membership. Not disqualify them, but remove them from church membership. Now, I I do want to talk about this point. And so I'm going to, for the next minute or two, couple minutes, I'm going to approach that subject specifically looking at sexual sins as the theme of this philosophy. We are going to look at it from that angle. We will do that. But I want to state right off the bat first, before we even dive into this, 
that I believe only looking at sexual sins in this particular topic, I believe it's biblical dishonesty. So I want to say that off the bat before we look at it. Nonetheless, I am going to take a look at it from that particular side over there, that sexual sins in somebody's life, if they don't get those right first, then they cannot join the church. That's a very interesting way of phrasing it, isn't it? Because now it sounds like you're in a conundrum. Here's a couple issues with holding to that view. Are you ready? Letter A, if we're using an outline format, I believe that someone who holds that view already has a problem with the premise of their philosophy. Because here's your premise. You'll look at a member who has a sexual sin in their life, and, and you'll look at them and say, or somebody who's a prospective member, someone who's not a member yet, but a prospective member, you'll look at them and say, well, because of your sin, fill in the blank, you can't join the church because of passages like 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5 is a passage where Paul is dealing with fornication within the church. That's what it's dealing with. Dealing with a guy who has known fornication with his father's wife. Read 1 Corinthians 5 for context. And Paul says, kick that guy out of the church. What's wrong with you? Why are you allowing that? Why is everybody okay with that? Now, you may be, if you're sitting out there listening in the great World Wide Web to the Sandy Creek Stirrings podcast, and you hold to this view, then you might say, exactly, that's what I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians 5 says you should remove them from church membership. Wait, 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 wait. You have an issue with using that passage, and here's the issue. Those passages are written to a church, written to a pastor, to specifically deal with someone inside the church, a member of the flock. It is not referring to prospective members. It is not referring to people who would like to join but haven't yet. Now, to use those passages and then apply them to this subject is not being honest with the context of the passage. It's dealing with a separate set of circumstances. Church member versus non-member. Somewhat grounded member, because apparently this guy was part of the church for a little while. Somewhat grounded member versus brand new baby Christian. Current membership versus prospective membership. A man who has already been talked to about his sin but refuses to change versus someone who has not been talked to about their sin. Those are completely different people, completely different circumstances. Frankly, to use that passage and apply it to this situation over here is a misuse. It's a misuse. It's not talking about that particular situation. Letter B, continuing this thought. 1 Corinthians 5, if we really want to use that particular passage, which is one that has been thrown to me, 1 Corinthians 5, well, I'm not supposed to try and correct the issues of those that are not my church. You say, what? What are you saying? Are you saying I shouldn't talk to anybody outside of my church about sin? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying, but in context, Paul tells the church that they have a responsibility. They have a requirement from God. They have the responsibility to that guy in the church who is involved in fornication, and it's known, then he says, you have a responsibility to handle it and kick that guy out of the church. Why? Because he is inside the church, because he is part of the church. And as he's continuing that thought, here's what he says in verses 12 through 13. He says this, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? He says, what what do you think I have to do with judging people outside the church? Do not ye judge them that are within? He says, hey, what? Why? Why are you even so? Here's here's the Corinthian church's response. They're like, so are we supposed to kick everybody out, or you know, talk to everybody out on the street about fornication? He says, what are you asking that question for? What do I have to do with anybody outside the church? You are required to judge people inside the church. And here's what he says in verse thirteen. But them that are without, God judgeth. He says, hey, the people outside these walls, God handles their sin. God is their judge. In contrast, he says this, Therefore, because God handles that, you are responsible to handle the inside. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. In context, Paul is saying that God handles the sin outside the church. 
The pastor, the church, is responsible to handle issues of sin within the church. Absolutely. But God handles this stuff on the outside. Meaning that if you try to correct the issue of someone who is not a church member, you have in some facet and some form just violated 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 through 13. You say, well, that, that's not referring to major sins. No, 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 no. It is absolutely referring to major sins, specifically sexual sins, specifically fornication where a man in the church had his mother's or had his father's wife. That's a major. And Paul says, hey, if they're outside the church, God handles that. If they're inside the church, we have the responsibility to handle that. Here's the reality. The reality is that church membership gives the pastor and the church the authority and the right to actually be able to guide, direct, and handle these types of situations. Now, here's your question. Here's the question you're thinking right now. I already know what it is. Josh of Sandy Creek Stirrings. Are you saying that we should let people who are involved in sexual sin, let's say somebody is shacked up with their girlfriend, they are living together outside of marriage, are you saying just because they got saved and they got baptized that we should make them a member of the church and just let them in while they are shacked up? No, I'm not saying that. You say, well, it sure does sound like you're saying that. No, I'm not saying that. Here's the reason why. That's up to your pastor. I, I don't have to give account for your church. I don't, have to give, I don't have to give account for your pastor. I don't have to give account for you as a church member of a different church. That's your pastor's job. And at the end of the day, he has to make that decision. I can't make that decision for your church. But I do just want to say that I at least want to see if that pastor and I are, to, are going to have a discussion about it. If we don't want to have a discussion about it, so be it. I don't, I don't have anything to judge about your pastor or to tell your pastor he's wrong. That's not my place. It's not my responsibility. But if him and I were to sit down and have a conversation about that subject, I would want to hear his biblical basis. I would want to hear his biblical reasoning. That's all I would be interested in. And my question to that pastor would be, if you try to approach and handle the issue before they join, how are you getting around? What's your answer to the problem of 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 through 13 that we just discussed? What's your justification for that? Now you say, well, what's the other option? The other option is, on the table, you let them join. You love on them. You let them grow a little. You give them a little grace. You trust that God will begin working on their heart. And now that they have joined the church, you as a pastor now have a responsibility, and you now have the right and the authority to now sit down with that couple and say, look, in a very gracious and humble manner, say, look, there's something in your life that is not pleasing to God, and we need to talk about it. You say, is that biblical, though? Well, let me show you something that I see from the Word of God. If we go over to Ephesians chapter 4, we'll take the next couple moments of our time and take a look at this particular passage in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. That we hence more, hence more, henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Ephesians 4, verses 14 through 15, the verses I just read, you tell the Ephesian church that they need to grow. Well, how do they grow? Well, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, for sake of time, this, this podcast episode has already become a little long, but if you were to read those seven verses, 17 through 24, you would find that Paul explains to the Ephesian church that if they want to grow, they now need to learn about the Word of God, gain knowledge of the Word of God, and this knowledge of God and growing in Him and walking in Him and putting on the new man, what will it do? It will challenge them to now put away sin. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 24, going through Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 8, which is continuing the same thought, tells them to now walk in love, because of this knowledge they have of God. They are commanded to grow. They get a knowledge of God's Word by studying God's Word. They now put on the new man. They walk in love, and they put away sin. 
Sins listed, like in verse number 3 of chapter 5, fornication and all uncleanness, which are those sexual sins that are talked about in this particular section. That particular passage right there, there Ephesians 4.24 through Ephesians 5.8, states that we used to be children of darkness, but now we should put those things away that are sin in our lives, and we should now walk as children of the light. Can I just remind you, Paul's talking to the church. So he has understanding, right? He, he has the command to grow. Then growth, when you want to grow, you need knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding produces putting away sin. Putting away, putting away sin produces walking as the children of the light. But notice what comes first before growth. Teaching and knowledge. Where does the new Christian, though, get teaching and knowledge and understanding from that leads them to later on, way later, the next chapter, verse number 3, what leads them to putting away the sins like fornication? Here's where it all starts. This happens before growth, is Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know what verses 11 through 12 are? They are gifts to the church. He gave them the gifts of pastors and apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists. Why did he give them? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? Because these people will challenge the church to grow, as we see in verse number 14. And that growth will produce them putting on the new man and having an understanding of the Word of God. That understanding and putting on of the new man will cause them to put away sin. Putting away sin will cause them to walk as the children of light. It will give them a testimony. It's a step-by-step. In summary, I ask you this. How can a non-member... How can a non-church member who does not have access to the gifts that are given to the local church, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, who the Bible says because of these gifts will perfect the saints, will be for the work of the ministry, will edify the body of Christ, will bring people into unity, will give them the knowledge of the Son of God, will challenge them to grow? How will they have access to those gifts to the local church if they are not allowed to be part of the local church? How? You see, and I will conclude with this. I believe the physical local New Testament church is just a picture of the true heavenly, the spiritual body of the church, the bride of Christ. You see, the physical shows us so many truths of the spiritual. You say, what do you, what do you mean? Well, in the spiritual realm, when someone gets saved, they are immediately baptized by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. We see that in Scripture, and and this is a completely different topic for a completely different time that could take its whole episode on what spiritually happens when you get saved. So I'm not going to dive in. I'm going to encourage you, look this up for yourself. Do some studying on this. But when someone gets saved, they are baptized by the Holy Spirit spiritually. And they are immediately added to that spiritual body, the church as a whole, the Bride of Christ. They get saved, baptized by the Holy Spirit, and added to the Bride of Christ, that body, the church. That's what happens spiritually. I believe that the physical is just an earthly representation of that spiritual thing. Because in the physical realm, we see that spiritually thing replicated in this. That when someone gets saved, they are baptized by water. And then they are added to the local church. I have a question. If God immediately adds them to the spiritual body, the bride of Christ, 
then why is a new baby Christian not good enough for your church? If they're good enough at the moment of salvation to be added to the church, the bride of Christ, then why are they not good enough for your local church? Are you saying that we Christians can't have grace and love? Are you saying that we can't give people time or even a chance to grow? I believe that we might be setting up newborn Christians for failure when we withhold church membership from them. Because it should not be shocking to us if we withhold church membership from a new baby, newborn Christian. It should not be shocking that our churches are not experiencing Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, a passage that tells us that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine passage that tells us they went from house to house breaking the bread. Uh, a passage that tells us they were all with one singleness of heart. A, heart uh, a passage that tells us that they all gave. A passage that they, tells us they continued daily in the temple. A passage that tells us they praised God and had favor with people. A passage that tells us that they continued because of this, continued to add to the church. Why don't we experience that in some of our churches? I think it's because we are withholding church membership, which is a vital necessity to the growth of a baby Christian. Now, are you saying, well, Brother Josh, at the end of this, it sounds like you just want us to let all sin run into the church? Absolutely not. I think we have to be wise. I think because of some sins that people have committed, we're talking about felonies and sexual sins that have led into civil issues. Yes, I think we need to be careful. Yes, I think every church should have a sexual predator policy. That if somebody is on the sexual offender list, that a church already has a policy in place when a prospective member comes and says, I'd like to join your church, I want to let you know I am a sexual offender, that you already have something in place that tells them, okay, here are the places in the building you're not allowed to go. Here are the places in the, in the ministry you are not allowed to serve. Here are some things. Yes, we need wisdom. We need all those things. But at the same time, can we not give brand new baby Christians a little bit of time to grow? Can we not show them grace and God's love before we come down on them and say, what you're doing is wicked and ungodly? Or can we not say, you know what, now that you're part of the church, the body of Christ, God wants us all to come together. There's something in your life we need to talk about. Can we not show grace and love to a newborn baby Christian? So that's the topic for today, Church 101, church membership at baptism or later on. I pray and hope that today was a help to you, maybe um, allowed you to see some things. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have any concerns, you can email me. My email is joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, don't forget, I want to hear from you, whether you message me on Facebook or you email me, joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. I want to hear what episode of Sandy Creek Stirrings, what thought, what series have you enjoyed the most, has helped you the most. You send those in to me today. Looking forward to hearing from you. Until next time, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ. Christ.